Hi, I'm actor Ian Champion, and welcome to History of Horror Cinema, my personal podcast tour of the good, bad, and the ugly of horror movie history. If you like what you hear, please don't forget to hit subscribe. The Body Snatcher, 1945 Writer Robert Louis Stevenson had a fascination with the grisly underbelly of his native Edinburgh that wasn't just a prurient pleasure enjoyed by a slumming, well-to-do gentleman. It also inspired his darkest fictional writing about the evils that men may do. The dissembling of a violent beast behind the demeanour of seeming virtue in The Strange Case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde in 1886 was influenced by Deacon William Brodie, a respectable security expert who ran a double life exploiting his skills to burgle the homes of the city gentry, whose reputation he cultivated by day. A more infamous case that was ideal fuel for Stevenson was the sensational true story of William Burke and William Hare, who, along with accomplices Helen McDougall and Margaret Hare, carried out 16 grave robbings during 1828 and sold them to eminent surgeon Dr. Robert Knox, who constantly needed fresh corpses to dissect with his students. The case exposed much that had been hidden from the public, including the ethical problem of how to maintain viable ongoing medical research when the only cadavers allowed were the limited supply gained legally from suicide, prison death, or orphaned or foundling corpses. The temptation of a lucrative black market supply and demand easily outweighed morality, especially if one argued the greater gain to society. Hare cut a deal to inform on his cohorts in lieu of prosecution. Ironically for Burke, his conviction resulted in his own hanging and dissection, and whose skeleton to this day is displayed within Edinburgh Medical School's Anatomical Museum. Stevenson's resulting short story, The Body Snatcher, was printed in December 1884. Unsurprisingly, a version of the Burke and Hare origin story eventually found its way onto the silver screen. Fortunately for horror fans, the first notable film to use it was produced by Val Luton as part of his 1940s tenure at RKO Studios. As usual, Luton involved himself fully in the screenplay co-written with Philip MacDonald, who had experience conveying an unsettling gothic sensibility for Alfred Hitchcock's Rebecca in 1940. Luton chose Robert Wise to helm a third project for him following up his impressive directing debut rescuing the overrunning Curse of the Cat People and the period war drama Mademoiselle Fifi later that year. There was no doubt, though, whose influence on the film was ultimately felt the most. Once again, The Body Snatcher bore the stamp of a Val Luton film that belied its title with much greater thematic depth and artistry than a standard B-movie. The talented producer not only added literary luster to the project, he also gave it a star in need of a career polishing, under somewhat straitened circumstances. As we saw in Arsenic and Old Lace, Boris Karloff had come back to Hollywood, refreshed from the show's stage success, yet soon found himself set back again by the relative failure of 1944's The Climax, and then the crumbling facade of Universal's horror franchises with House of Frankenstein. It was during the amiable filming of the latter that Karloff was contacted by RKO with a view to working on their horror films. An exciting prospect indeed, but one that Luton was actually resistant to. This was instead the brainchild of the studio's new boss, former Universal executive Jack G. Gross. Stephen Jacobs' biography quotes Robert Wise when he, along with fellow director Mark Robson and Luton, reluctantly first met the English actor. But when he turned those eyes on us, and that velvety voice said, Good afternoon, gentlemen, we were his, and never thought about anything else. Karloff signed with RKO on May 18, 1944. It was to be the beginning of a happy partnership between star and studio. While Gross revealed a coarseness of approach in what he wanted to see on screen, Luton soon discovered a kindred ally in Karloff, an artist who shared his refined taste in horror aesthetics. As we've seen, Karloff had certainly suffered his unfair share of movie roles catering to the lowest denominator of audience and filmmaker. He appreciated that his new producer's films, I quote, were based on the principle of making the audience do most of the work, using hints and suggestions which each spectator's imagination could play round. Karloff's initial workload did not go according to plan. Isle of the Dead was to be his opening commitment. 
but an agonizing back pain that began on the climax meant that he could only endure part of the scheduled shoot. Luton was forced to shut down production while the star went into hospital for spinal fusion and a month's recuperation. Thus, the body snatcher now had to precede it. Despite Luton's sensitivity and restraint with screenplays, the original script for this replacement was to contain such graphic scenes of the grave robber's handiwork that the Breen office insisted they be removed. Even upon release, any mere mention of Burke and Hare was trimmed from the British print, and it was not until 1998 that UK video audiences could finally see an uncut version. In constructing the movie, and to better position their headlining actor, Luton and MacDonald gave greater prominence to Karloff's role, the evil cabman John Gray, than he had in Stevenson's story. There, the essential plot revolved around a cover-up of Gray's murder by eminent Dr. McFarlane, and his former medical school colleague Fetus, whom he pressurizes into support with the threat of revealing their sordid past paying for stolen corpses. For this reimagining, the body snatcher would stress McFarlane more by having Gray as his malevolent supplier, a combined Burke and Hare to his Dr. Knox in effect. This creates a gripping, high-stakes dilemma of forced secrecy upon McFarlane, and a complex, deep-seated relationship between the two men. The production was on secure ground with its casting. To play the scheming McFarlane, RKO wisely cast Henry Danielle a renowned go-to figure for a particular type of British sneaky epicene villainy, so much so that Christopher Guest's preparation for his marvellous Count Rugen in The Princess Bride was to study Danielle's Lord Wolfingham from The Sea Hawk in 1940. By contrast, wholesome junior Dr. Fetus is Russell Wade, the Luton Company player we recall as the fleeting near saviour to the ladies in The Leopard Man, then awarded a lead hero role befitting his innate decency persona in The Ghost Ship that year. Although Wade is a little stiff and over-earnest at times, he has a natural warmth and bedside manner with crippled child Georgina Marsh, Sharon Moffat, that is crucial in establishing a major theme of the film. The difference between his humanity and McFarlane's frosty professionalism that the little girl is unresponsive to emphasizes that medical treatment needs to be more than just clinical knowledge for the patient to respond. The doctor must have a feeling for healing, as it were. Much later, Fetus will sum up his mentor's shortcoming, but he couldn't teach me the poetry of medicine. Someone else equipped with a kindly soul is Mary Gordon's Mrs. McBride, an early mourner unaware of the post-mortem use made of her son. Gordon was best known as housekeeper Mrs. Hudson in the Basil Rathbone Sherlock Holmes films. Her buried boy also becomes a neat opportunity for another true Edinburgh character to be woven into the tale. Greyfriars Bobby was a Sky Terrier who famously, if he existed, spent the last 14 years of his life till 1872 sitting atop the grave of his dead master John Grey, refusing to leave. Since Karloff's part only shares the same name, this was perhaps enough to connect the two. Other than the scene where Grey relieves Bobby's duty with a fatal spade blow, but fortunately for dog lovers, this is off camera. It isn't only a legendary pooch that's ignominiously snuffed out in the body snatcher. Horror fans seeing the poster expected another Karloff Lugosi team up. It occurs, but merely served to highlight a sad disparity between the two friends' respective statuses by then. While Karloff revels in his lead part, blackmailing Danielle with lascivious glee and wicked grins, Lugosi is merely spotted a couple of times eavesdropping on the periphery of events as medical school janitor Joseph. When he and Karloff finally do cross paths so Joseph can extort cash from him, Karloff gets to hog the scene, leading Lugosi a merry jig of ghoulish seduction, much to Joseph's underwritten amusement. I don't understand the song. The only dignity really accorded Lugosi is that his suffocation by Karloff is held for impact, while the combatants are artfully half-lit by Luton's house cinematographer Robert deGrasse. deGrasse's work on the film is imaginative enough to draw attention to itself in the best way. Coupled with Terry Kellum and Bailey Fesler's eerily effective sound design, 
The scene of the murder of the street singer Donna Lee, for example, shows what can be achieved with simplicity rather than banality. We hear the lonely echo of Gray's horse's hooves underscoring her ditty as the camera watches his carriage following her through the archway. The shot doesn't take us any further in, swallowing the arch in shadow. The take continues, leaving us hanging helplessly. Then suddenly her voice is cut off. No scream, just abrupt silence. How easily a life may be extinguished anonymously in the big city. The most interesting aspect of the body snatcher is the bond that unites McFarlane with his ever-present nemesis. While the doctor is sickened by the ongoing need he has for Gray's nocturnal excavations, the latter gains a perverse strength from their relationship that he will never give up. He cannot resist the constant taunting of Toddy because without the blackmail grip he has upon him, Gray is just a lowly working cabman. And yet, as long as the great Dr. McFarlane jumps to my whistle, I am a man. He is possessed of more than incriminating history, though, about the anatomist. That piercing gaze of Karloff shrewdly penetrates his employer's soul, echoing Fetus when he says, There's a lot of knowledge in those eyes, but no understanding. A sense of inexorable doom shackles these two partners in crime together, a gothic dread that will suffocate them as much as their own victims. Rita Corday's Mrs. March sees it with the second sight of the ancient Highlanders, and her prophecy to Fetus drips with nightmarish gothic imagery. The pit yawns for them. Evocative period lines like this balance an awkward faux-Scottish tendency throughout the film, variations on I, lassie, etc., that clang like shortbread tins out of the mouths of the firmly English and American accented cast. Sure enough, the foretold retribution comes to pass, and with a startling resolution payoff thanks to powerful direction and Degrasse's stunning lighting. Cleaving to Stevenson's ending, McFarlane takes over the body snatching with Fetus as his unwilling assistant, and is horrified to discover that the female body they've dug up is actually grey. Never get rid of me, his voice teases from beyond the grave. As McFarlane drives the carriage through lashing rain, Grey's corpse then falls over him, just as a lightning flash hits. His body glows with almost supernatural phosphorescence, in a grotesque parody of a ghost haunting his ex-partner. No wonder McFarlane takes the low road, to a fatal crash. A pulse-pounding conclusion to a well-told tale. As such fertile burial ground for horror, the grisly story of Burke and Hare's nocturnal enterprises has since been remade by director Freddie Francis as The Doctor and the Devils in 1985 and by John Landis with Burke and Hare in 2010, starring Simon Pegg and Andy Serkis. Thanks for listening. If you like what you hear, please don't forget to hit subscribe.